Well, you could say that. Um, since I'm the last speaker, I thought it would be appropriate to just thank the organizers, not just for inviting me here, but for putting together this fabulous conference. And the hospitality of the ICTS has been amazing. So please. Okay. So um, let me talk about chaos, um, and, and in particular, controllable chaos, which is kind of the opposite of what they tell you chaos is. Um, so um, this is based on stuff that is in progress. Um, there's some pretty kind of self-similar thing in there. You'll see where that comes from later. Um, but the, um, the idea is um, there are a class of problems that I want to solve, like what happens in real-time dynamics in quantum field theory. You take a system, you start out of equilibrium, you let it evolve, and then the question is what happens. Uh, you need to choose an initial state and evolve it. And, you know, want to compute com expectation values of interesting observables. And the usual thing that happens or is that um, there's all these things we want to compute, and one of them is entanglement or entropies or patterns, um, and they're really hard problems. And the reason is it's the sign problem. with The real-time dynamics, and you need to sum with trajectories in quantum mechanics that interfere. Uh, if you want to do it in a Hamiltonian formalism uh, and you just kind of want to brute force compute the, the, uh, the individual terms in the Hamiltonian, um, the wave function have so many variables that the problem quickly runs out of steam. Uh, and, but if you want to find the ground state of, let's say, a condensed matter system, other people have been very clever and have found all kinds of different ways to encode it like the MRG, tensor network. So for low-lying states and gap systems, in few dimensions, the problem is more or less tractable. OK. Uh, OK. If you do holography, we actually have some answers to some of these questions. So Chesler and Jaffe learned, taught us how to put ADS dynamically on a computer and how to study one-point functions of interesting operators. And then Yuta Kayanagi told us how to compute entropies for static states. And this was kind of generalized to these uh, Hubeni, Rengamani, Takayanagi surfaces, which basically tell us how to solve some problem at large n by doing uh, extremal surfaces in gravity. So they reduce the problem to a classical problem. And I want to understand this. I want to understand where this comes from. Um, come on. Um, and to do response functions, uh, well, you just put Green's functions on whatever solution you have. Um, but it turns out that these can encode chaos. So Schenker and Stanford told us that if you throw an observer into a black hole, uh, they will see signals of chaos in something that basically has to do with the redshift properties or, or blue shift if you're coming out of it. Um, uh, uh, of shock waves, and uh, there was this very interesting analytic band of chaos by Mandelson and Schenker Stanford that told us that you take an equilibrium system, the quantum lapon of exponents are bounded by the temperature with a few X provisos. Um, so the question is, where does this come from? Where does all of this come from? And, um, you do quantum chaos, um, well, you can at least take the semi-classical limit on some small systems, and the quantum Lyapunov of exponents match the classical physics. But they're hard to compute. If you've ever computed a Lyapunov of exponent, you typically have to put it on a computer and wait a very long time before you get an answer. Uh, and now, if you add the quantum on top of that, quantum and long time don't talk together well. Uh, they also control entanglement rates because of work of Zurich Pass, although it's not clear when they actually apply this, 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 these ideas. And, you know, numerical quantum examples usually have two variables. That's where the, where the stuff is. So let me tell you what, what I want to do. Um, let's build a class of simple models where this can be computed analytically and numerically and semi-analytically. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you what these models look like. So it's based on something called cat maps. And I'll generalize those and make generalized cat maps. And I'll show you some lattice-like models and why they're computable, and then some results that are both theory and, and eventually numerically. Okay, so what's a cat map? Cat map is linear physics. You take two coordinates, you 
transform them by a linear transformation, and you get two new coordinates. And you want to think about it as a linear canonical map on 2D phase space. So if you want to preserve the volume, then the matrix has the determinant one. And this looks really boring because we know linear physics. So the idea of the CAD map is um, you compactify by making the coordinates periodic, and then the compatibility with the periodicity makes the matrix transformation integer value. So when you're doing classical physics, this is just linear physics, except that you're kind of mapping this thing back onto itself. And it is known that the dynamics of these maps classically are chaotic and mixing. And the eigenvalues of the matrix that you have, these A, B, C, D, are the lie of exponents, and they only depend on the trace. And you can compute everything analytically. Okay? So people have spent a lot of time studying these objects because they're an ideal toy model of chaos. OK. You quantize it, you need to take these x1 and y1 and make them into operators, but you cannot take a multi-valued function and call it an operator. So what you do is you exponentiate, and then you clear the, the, the multi-valuedness. And then q and p are the things that you quantize. And then the commutation between x and y, which is h bar, tells you that when you pass q past p, you get a phase. And the phase require, is required to be a root of unity. And maybe some of you recognize these relations as the toothed linking relations for, for uh, uh, operators and monopoles. Oops. OK, so um, these are well known. They're the QP matrices. Um, so these are the clock shift matrices. And the quantized CAD map, basically, you can think of as an automorphism of the, of the PQ algebra. So the new Q is Q to the A, P to the B, and then P new is Q to the C, P to the D. And all of this is up to phases because there's some normal ordering ambiguities. So I've basically uh, swept that under the rug. Um, and if you take the P and Q matrices to be semi-classical, meaning very large matrices, uh, one can check that the Lapinov exponents of the quantum system is the same as the classical system when the end, the phase goes to zero. So the representation of the PQ matrices with that root of unity is unique and of dimension n. And then these automorphisms have to act as unitary, unitary transformations of this representation. And you can iterate them to get a quantum dynamics. So the problem is you only have one degree of freedom. One x and one p is basically one, one degree of freedom in phase space. Uh, and there's only one large Lyapunov exponent. So the two Lyapunov exponents are. So the idea is to generalize. Um, so you take many p's, many q's, one p and one q per site, and then you want to basically consider more general linear automorphisms, the logs of q and logs of p, and basically build a big matrix rather than just a two by two matrix. Uh, and then to avoid normal ordering ambiguities, you want to make q a function of q and p a function of p. And consistency tells you that you usually represent these by a matrix M, and then in P you get the inverse transpose. That's the condition for this thing to be an automorphism. Uh, and the matrix M is integer valued and of determinant one and defines in principle a unitary in, um, uh, in this bigger system. And we suggested a slightly different set of, of objects in a previous paper with uh, Antonio Garcia. But now what we can do is take this and just iterate, and then we have a quantum dynamics, where since you have more than one degree of freedom and you have a non-trivial factorization of phase space or, or of Hilbert space, you can actually study entanglement and see what happens. So what we are going to choose is an initial state that is disentangled, meaning on each PQ site, you get a different one. Uh, it's a product state. And you evolve by basically choosing a matrix. And its powers are generated basically by the dynamics. And then one can compute the VEVs of various monomials of the PQ matrices and see how they evolve. And one can also compute the entanglement between various subsystems. So why it's easy to compute VEVs is actually a, a, a very nice property of the system, is that the expectation value of your favorite monomial at time t can be thought of as the evolution of the corresponding monomial uh, uh, evaluated in the initial state. And this thing is basically Q to the mt, and these are nice and easy to multiply and construct. 
Um, so you can evaluate this monomial in the ground state, and because it's a product state, it factorizes. So you reduce the problem to a whole bunch of single lattice computations, and you never have to compute the wave function in the final state. So the idea is that here we kind of cut the time by basically solving the dynamics on the algebra rather than on the wave function, and then we never have to deal with a big Hilbert space directly. <clears throat> so the problem reduces to multiplying matrices of time n times n and not the size of the Hilbert space. Okay, so that's for VEVs. And from VEVs, at least at one side, you can recover the local density matrix at the site because the VEVs are basically the trace of rho times the observable at that point. And so if you pick your favorite observable at time t and you know how to evaluate these objects, uh, this is a linear functional on the rho, and if you have all the monomials, then you know rho. And then the idea is that you can extract rho from all of these VEVs. So in principle, you can determine the density matrix if you have a complete basis for A, and this actually is provided by the monomials. So you can recover the density matrix at one site at time t. If you want to do two sites that are neighboring, then you have to play the same game, but now the algebra A is the algebra of the two sites, and now instead of having n squared operators, now you have n to the fourth operators. So as you make the system bigger, where you want to analyze the density matrix, eventually you run out of computer time. So, uh, but for small sites or for small subregions, you can actually do something. Okay, so for num small numbers of sites, it is tractable and for arbitrary initial product states. So you can study how it works. Now, how do you put it on a lattice? Basically, you consider products of simple nearest neighbor entanglers to generate the full matrix. So you take two of these and you evolve them on the same and you kind of mix them with some M that's your favorite M. And then you do it again on the next row so you can entangle these objects with these objects. And then these two block set can be iterated. And then this is something that generates a dynamics. Um, and basically, both the M of the Q and the M of the P are sparse because the P will also only have this similar structure. Okay, so, and that's roughly what defines locality, that you have sparse M and sparse M inverse transpose. So this is a good model for Hamiltonian dynamics on a nearest neighbor side. So this is where I have to tell you something which you might know or might not know, which is that if you put spin systems on a line, there's a Lee Robinson bound that tells you that information cannot travel faster than some speed. So if you put something that puts a limit on the speed of information transfer, you're mimicking something that we know from theory. Uh, it has controllable chaos, and we can choose basically the local entanglers to have small, uh, bigger or smaller eigenvalues, uh, and that basically lets us control the total chaos of the system, because once you have the matrix M for the big sites, for all the sites, you can just take the eigenvalues of that, and that the log of those eigenvalues basically gives you the Lyapunov exponents. So you can basically engineer the Lyapunov exponents by hand. You don't have to do any more work to compute them. And we can easily change the size of the local Hilbert space, so we can change n. So all of these dynamics come with an extra parameter called n, which basically plays the role of h bar. And you can study h bar to zero and h bar to be really big. Okay. Yes, but I want them sparse. <laughs> okay, so the simplest result is you take two sides and just see what happens with the simplest cat map. And then I'll show you some results of 1D lattices with simple entanglers and various n. Okay, so what's the idea? The idea is that the Qs were functions of Q. And this is something that at the beginning I put just to fix the face up, but it has another consequence, which is that the images of Q commute with the Qs themselves, so they can all be mutually diagonalizable simultaneously. So the unitary dynamics in this basis, the one that diagonalizes Q, ends up being a discrete cat dynamics on the rational points of lattices, um, uh, uh, where um, you have the eigenvalues of Q being sent to the other eigenvalues of the products, uh, basically by doing the same matrix modulo n, okay? So it's basically rational points with the nominator n on the torus. 
So now basis states are factorized, so a basis state goes to a basis state. So if you start with a basis state, there's no entanglement as time goes by. So this is a setup where there's a large class of states which evolve dynamically and there's no entanglement. Um, you can also take a basis state times random. So the problem you are faced with is if the new x and the new y, which is the matrix times the old ones, um, if x is fixed but y is if x is fixed but y varies, you have to worry whether the for every different y old you get a different x and a different y. So this actually depends on the size of n. Uh, it depends on the arithmetic of the matrix. So if you choose n prime for simplicity, then most of the times you're going to be all right. Um, so up to n times you're going to start getting multiples of p when you take the matrix product over here to the nth power. So eventually you come back to where you started. But in the meantime, uh, for small t, you can basically follow something that traces the classical dynamics pretty, uh, pretty easily. Okay, so what happens then is that you started with your wave function, which is only in the second argument, and then you take the transform of k dot k prime t, and k is fixed, uh, but all of these are different. So what happens is that when you take this thing over here and trace over the second one, you get a diagonal density matrix. The diagonal density matrix is in the basis of the k prime, and the eigenvalues are the wave function, the probabilities of being in the initial state. And this is because the images of k prime in the first coordinate, let's say, are all uh, orthogonal states. So when you trace over them, uh, you just pick the different k primes. Okay. So basically, the entanglement can be read from the initial probabilities. So this is a system where you can control things. Um, and then if you take a random psi 2, then the typical probabilities of order 1 over n for each one of the basis states. And then the entropy is all generated in one shot, and it's log n. But I told you before that the system had Lapin of exponents, and there should be some relation to entanglement entropy generation. So what you can do instead is um, take a Gaussian state, a Gaussian state, and to build a Gaussian state, you basically take these coherent states that Gori Shiki was talking about a couple of years ago. Um, and then what you can do is basically evolve in time and compute the entropy, so the entropy can be computed by various ways. This is the maximum lab value, so I was doing n equal 433. So this takes a couple of minutes on my computer, um, but it's less than one hour. So the red line is what you get if you do computations with linear dynamics for a Gaussian state in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space without including the periodicity. And then in this case, Gaussian states evolve into Gaussian states, and we know how to compute all the entanglement entropies. And the asymptotic value of this slope, it's twice the maximum Lyapunov exponent. Uh, this can be shown. Um, so this basically shows that for this class of states, pretty generically, one is going to get the semi-classical result because the wave functions are kind of semi-classical in the initial state. So a lot of these results that have to do with, let's say, uh, pass Zurich or that involve Lyapunov exponent seem to require that the initial state be kind of classical in some sense. So I told you a quantum example. Uh, basis times random, and you get full entanglement in one shot. Whereas here, the entanglement kind of builds up slowly. Okay, um, okay so we showed some of these relations to the of exponents in 2015. Uh, and then the slope in this case is really close to the final value in the first few steps, and that's because the Lapinov exponent is actually large. So semi-classical is pretty much a good estimate all the way up to where well, this thing hits the maximum entropy that you need. Okay. So the last one is entanglement state rates are sensitive to the choice of state. If very quantum initial, it can be fast or zero, or very special is zero, and semi-classical, you can get something that's kind of Lapunov-like. So Lapunov exponents control that type of physics. Okay, now let's do my simple lattice. So now we go to 1D problem. And I'm going to choose the simplest two by two matrix, one, one, zero, one. Uh, and we put the same matrix in each one of these crossings. Uh, and one full step of evolution is do first this operation and then this one. And that's enough to basically have all spins talk to their nearest neighbors. And it gives you the opportunity to communicate between places over here and places over here. Okay? 
So this is a toy model of real-time evolution on a lattice. Uh, and now how the full M looks like is basically something like this. So you take those and it looks upper triangular. So you take an upper triangular matrix, all the eigenvalues are one, and you would be inclined to say that there's never any chaos. But that's true because we imposed open boundary conditions, meaning that we have a left and a right and we didn't close the system. As soon as you close the system, you're going to get chaos with periodic boundary conditions. So the eigenvalues of this thing, when you end up with the extra little corners over here, end up being non-zero and you end up having a non-trivial chaotic dynamic. So this is close to chaos in, in, uh, in some sense. <clears throat> Okay, so we're doing now the special case, n equal to 2, so instead of doing the very classical, uh, I'm going to do the very quantum. And then uh, on each side, there's only two possible values, 0 and 1. And then the map basically sends x to x plus y, modulo 2, and, and uh, y goes to y. So if you don't recognize this, what that means is that if y is 1, you flip x. Uh, this is a C0 quantum gate. So this is a, a controlled not uh, uh, gate. This is a special case of one of these phase uh, uh, gates uh, that can be applied where it's a rotation with a control. But this one is in a slightly different basis. But this is basically something that lets you flip one bit with another one as control. And it's basically, classically, the thing that builds all computers. Okay? So here we have an iterative scheme that lets us do that. Um, so, this is not a field theory. So, this is the C0 uh, uh, setup. Um, so, the features is the same as before. The queues can all be diagonalized simultaneously. So, you get a permutation dynamics where the upper entries get modified by entries below, but not the other way around because I chose a matrix that was upper triangular. So, you can think of these as sending classical messages from the right bits to the left. Uh, and then the question is, when do the last m bits, the ones that we started at the beginning, get mapped one-to-one -one into a collection of m bits at some random position that we choose? So if that happens, then the same type of argument will, will tell us that you can basically understand a little bit about entanglement. And then the problem reduces to computing the determinant of a sub-block of the matrix being invertible or not, modulo n. So what you can do is just put that information, put it on my computer, and then, after a little bit of time, you get this pattern. So time evolves here, the position, distance from the origin goes here. This is what happens for a message of length 1. And what you see is that if you start at position 1 and you read at position 1 at time t, then you get full correlation, meaning the information is there always. But as soon as you go to some of these other places, the information is there sometimes and sometimes not. And the pattern that you get is basically something where the triangles get always bigger, and it's self-similar. And it's a fractal, as you try to take the size to infinity. So when you think of a fractal, you should think that this is more chaotic than it looked like, even though it was um, all eigenvalues being equal to 1. So this is what happens with a message of length 1. If you take a length 3 message, you get a similar pattern. Length 6, the triangles get a little bit bigger, but it still has the same qualitative behavior. And then the length 16 message has all these triangles filled in some sense. But you still get the same pattern that you can send basically whichever message you want um, forward in time. And you see that there's this kind of nice line here that goes all the way and that tells you that you've successfully sent the message and it keeps on going. So what happens is that the position gets of the last s bits, if everything else is initialized at zero, gets mapped into a copy of it. So it's like having a being sent to f of a, g of a, f of f of a, g of a, h of a, and so on and so on. So it's basically equivalent to repeating the message. And the velocity of the first message is the same regardless of length. So that gives you a notion of how quickly you entangle the system. And if you compute that, you start with a random state in the last s bits and let it go, you get that the amount of entanglement entropy that you get after the message gets out is exactly 2k log n. Roughly. Yes. Why doesn't it violate the no cloning? Because it's a classical message. <laughs> it's a classical message. Okay, so uh, give me two more minutes and I'll be done. 
Uh, but it's quantum mechanics. So there's also the dual P basis. In the dual P basis, the matrices are inverse, transpose, so they're lower triangular. So the P basis only sends messages to the right, so the quantum can subvert the classical intuition. So instead of sending messages to the left, as one would be naively inclined, you can end up sending messages to the right in the P basis. So if you initialize everything in the P basis and do something random in the first few things on the left, you can send messages to the right. All right. Here's the fun part. If you start with P on some ground state or basically P basis over here, and you start Q basis over here, in one direction, the messages want to go this way. In the other one, they want to get here. And you can basically engineer a stop every place where you want to, because what happens is that as the message is trying to be sent over here, it'll magically interfere because of the properties of the P, the P dynamics that says that you only send things to the right. So you can actually block the message from ever arriving to the left. Uh, you basically can stop the entangling from happening. So this is very weird. Uh, so that can produce weird patterns on a entanglement where it's basically contained in an interval. So uh, I don't know how realistic this is, but you know, this is what you get. Uh, so the conclusion is there's this toy model where both chaos and entanglement can be studied semi-analytically. For more general states that are more exotic, one has to resort to some sort of simulation. But at least it's highly computable for various problems because they factorize and can compute density matrices and even do some things analytically for some class of states. But if I take something that's not quite P basis over here and some, or, or P ground state over here and not quite Q ground state over here, how these two will talk to each other and how much they're gonna basically stop each other from entangling is something that presumably will be numerics. Well, the details of how much you entangle depend on state and N. There's a band on entanglement controlled by log N, but it's Lyapunov exponents in the semi-classical regime you can block the entanglement production. And uh, here's what you can do, and here's what happens if you change the matrices. Okay. That's it. Any question or comment? So, is, is there um, an, an analog of uh, microcanonical ensembles and therm thermalization? Can you say that again? Um, I was just wondering if there's an analog of a uh, thermalization. Uh, can you see uh, ergodicity or anything like that? Right. So for periodic boundary conditions, you should get ergodicity. In so not, not full ergodicity because there's some states, right, a basis state goes to a basis state. But if you start with something more generic, that's a more random product state at each one of them, it should be pretty ergodic because it's a discretization of this map, which is ergodic. So it should have some interesting dynamics of thermalization, but the interesting part is how much does it compete between, let's say, the P basis versus the Q basis? And how much can one sometimes control the rate at which the pieces entangle? In this system, you can't put temperature because it's discrete time. So that's, I don't have a way to, to characterize that fully. Does the model have any conserved, analog of conserved quantities like energy? <laughs> Um, no, uh, not yet, or, or, I mean, it has a conserved splitting between P and Q because I chose it special, but I can still mix the P and Qs with some other cat maps between them, and then that system is more generic and it's not going to have these special properties that messages get only sent in one direction. And that one would probably be more realistic, but I need to solve the phase problem. Yes. Is there a way to see that the Sierpinski triangle is naturally going to come out of this dynamics? Uh, I wouldn't have guessed it ahead of time, but maybe that's... <laughs> Presumably. Uh, these are subdeterminants on some block. When I started seeing these patterns, it was very tantalizing. But these are not just the Sierpinski triangles. These are all kinds of things. So if you do n equals 7, that means things are mod 7. All of these basically have a pattern of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 pieces over here. So it's kind of like 7 triangles that are kind of subdivided in 7 pieces. If you do a different M, then you get them in some sort of square pattern where it's kind of more like where, where the triangles kind of grow in this direction rather than along the diagonals. So it's, it's fun. <laughs> Thank you.
other question or comment? If not, let's thank David again. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to the other thing, I presume.